Alfred William Shackleford, known to many quite simply as Shack, brought entertainment to the city of Lethbridge from 1921 to 1990. Together with his son Bob, their story spans the movie industry from the silent picture era to the technical vastness of today's blockbusters. Two gentlemen heard about me, and I don't know what they heard, because I'd never run a theater. That wasn't my fault. I, uh, my, my, my position in life was going to be an architect or a draftsman. It was just one of those things where you change life in the middle of the stream. As a businessman, Shaq was on the move, always open to opportunity. Shaq guided his partners through the development of a growing theater business here in the city of Lethbridge. What happened when I came to manage the King's Theater, I met a man by the name de Gurr, and he had a tailor shop down south on Fifth Street, and I used to take my clothes in there to be cleaned and prepped, and I would run a slide on the screen, free, if he give me free, dry cleaning. And I got to know him very well, and I didn't have a car. And uh, I got talking to him, and I said, you know, uh, if we could get this theater, I think it'd be a good thing. Well, he said, if you have an opportunity, let me know. Well, I found out that the lease was $3,000. Well, I didn't have $3,000. So I went to him, and he said, I'll put up $1,500 if you can get the other fifteen. So I went back to Calgary to my dad and my wife's dad, and anybody I could find would loan me $1,500. So together we formed a company. What was the company called? Well, matter of fact, the uh, name hardly ever known, Lethbridge Amusements Company Limited. The idea being that we not only would be in the theater business, we could be in the, uh, the dancing business, we could do anything we wanted as long as it was amusement. What were the movies like at that time? Well, they were silent. Um, uh, they, many, many times. That was the beginning when they first put a mo motor on them. But before that, they used to crank them. Did you have the piano player playing Yes, away? we had a piano, piano player. And that <laughs> When I took over, they had a piano player and uh, a violin player and a man with drums. But I took a look at the expense sheet and I decided I'd have to run it with one, the piano. My mother and father played for Mr. Shackelford for many, many, many years uh, in, in the silent picture days. And he was so good to them because, you see, in, in the 1930s, not only did the Depression hit, but all these musicians across North America were thrown out of work because the talking pictures came in. They didn't need orchestras anymore. And uh, I can remember my dad in the old Colonial Theater, he had about an eight-piece orchestra, and they were there every night playing for the silent picture days, you know. What kind of movies would be shown at that time, though, besides being silent? Who were, who were some of the stars at that time? Well, of course, with me, Western stars, Tom Mix, Buck Jones, and people like that. That's what made me, because I played all the Western stars, and Gene Autry, no matter what it was, William Farnham, Zane Gray Westerns, and everything. So did you have control of what would be shown in that theater? Yes, when I was a manager, but when I came down from Calgary, I had in my pocket a contract for the pictures I've just named. How did you know the Westerns were going to work? Well, because everybody when I worked in Calgary, there was one part of my life I was working in the film exchange. And everybody that came in there was buying these Western pictures. So I decided it was good enough for them, it be good enough for me. The Capitol Theater was one of the most beautiful theaters. We took that, we took that over in about 1925. And we decided, and the same man, that I told you came with me, we went partners, stayed with me. And we took over the, what was then the Colonial Theater because the Western pictures that I was playing affected their business. So they, matter of fact, uh, they went out of business. 
and I had an opportunity to get hold of the Colonial. So I said to D, the ta he was the tailor, and we called him D, the big letter D, D, the tailor. Well, I said, I tell you what we'll do. You give me the old care to spend the money, and you guarantee a note at the bank. And I tell her what we'll do. Immediately we get, I said, the lease or with an option to buy that we close the King's Theatre, providing the Empress Theatre pays half the rent. So the King's Theatre went out of business. So that cut down the number of theatres. The result was, I, uh, like I was making money in the King, I, I made it in the Colonial. All right, now talk about the progression here. Well, Bob, colonial, fill us in. The colonial came, became the palace, did it not? I was going to come that up. And then from the palace it became the capital. Well, and you know, we went in the palace because we, the reason we call it a pa palace, Calgary's Palace Theatre was a great, great theatre in Calgary. They wanted to get rid of a great big vertical sign. So I said, ship it, ship it here and we'll call the theatre the palace. <laughs> That's oh, good business. I was thinking about the, <laughs> the bucks, eh? And uh, I, I think that's why he did uh, so good in the, in the theater business. All right, so then we had the Capitol, we had the Roxy then, mm -hmm. and then the Paramount came along. Well, not until 1950. You're, you're going too fast. Okay, bring me or back. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got to go back to the, the p p Capitol. We've got to renovate that, and how could we do that? Mm -hmm. Now we need more money. Now I need more money. How am I going to get it? Well, my success has always been in life to meet people with money, providing they would back me. So I met, I met some uh, top businessmen, and I said, I wanted to form a company, but I needed two or $300,000 because I wanted to go to Toronto and talk to famous players and see if they would come in with us because I heard that they were going to come in here in opposition to it, and I wanted to stop it. And the only way I could stop it was join with them. So I went to, with the famous players, and I got the money. And then we took the, 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 palace, the, 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 the palace theater, and we practically built half of it with the people inside. What we did, we bought the lot to the north, you understand? Mm -hmm. And we built that whole wall while the people were in the show. Now, we, now we've got to make a move because we changed the pa palace from 50 feet to 75. So we closed it and took out the, the old wall at 50 feet and the roof off and uh, put proper steel trusses above. And it wasn't long before we ha could reopen, and we reopened it as the Capitol Theatre. The Capitol Theatre was opened in uh, Thanksgiving Day, 1929. If you, you'll always remember that. That was the day with the tremendous crash in the market. Mm. And here we were with a theatre that cost us over $300,000, and we were worried about the business because we had to charge 60 cents, which they never heard of before. A.W. went on to buy 10 lots, one at a time, along 8th Street. We eventually decided to build on these lots I got. So we called for the contractors and we built that, which then was another beautiful theater, the Paramount Theater. No sooner as we got the Paramount Theater open, we find somebody's buying acres out on Mammograth Drive to build a drive-in. And we had had that in mind ourselves, but they beat us to that one. So we, and of course people went to the drive-in by the, oh, they just jammed the place. Because it was something new. Yeah, something new. And uh, so happened that Kershaw and company from Calgary, who owned the drive-in here in Calgary and Edmonton, wanted to sell the three drive-in. So they went to Famous Players and said, we'll sell you all the drive-ins in, uh, in Alberta that we own, because they were, they were hurting Famous Players in Lethbridge and Calgary and Edmonton. So the head office came up here from uh, Toronto and called me into Calgary. 
And so I met with them. We agreed, we agreed uh, uh, on a big price for the driver that we would buy it. But no sooner than I got back to Lethbridge from Calgary, I learned the famous, uh, no, uh, they backed out of the deal. And the only one they wanted to sell was Lethbridge. So, uh, so I was lucky. I, uh, they wouldn't buy Calgary. They figured Calgary and Edmonton was worth so much more money in the future. But the one in the drive-in here wasn't. There's lo lots of stories I could tell you about the drive-in theater. Like what? Well, the boys and girls, they, they used to take their girls out there and they, you know. They used to call it the passion, hands. passion pit. Sure, they well, hands. Well, I agree with you what they called it, but we used to have two men roaming around up and down with a flashlight. And if he couldn't see him in the front seat, he put a flashlight. <laughs> and he was the guy that saw all the action. I don't know whether that's allowed on TV or not, Father. <laughs> I, I just saw all the action. I didn't say what they were doing. Not they could be drinking beer. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that either. Oh, they could be doing anything. Well, they can cut, they can cut this out. If they don't like what we're saying, Let they can cut it out. Let our imagination guide us. <laughs> yes, just stop right there. <laughs>
to, to give money to a couple who needed to move along, who would see that the family had blankets, who would, uh, and nobody knew this side of a very astute businessman, a man who had really brought entertainment to the city, because you've got to remember, it goes back multitudinous years. What do you want to be remembered for? Well, my opinion is this. When you step out of office, you hang up the receiver on the phone, and that's it. Nobody calls you up anymore. That's the way it should be. As you listen to your dad, Bob, and you, you hear all these stories coming out, you were starting to get into the theater business as well, weren't you? Well, yes. Um, uh, as time went by, of course, uh, uh, I used to spend a lot of time at the theater, as much as I could, uh, seeing the movies and whatnot, uh, because it didn't cost me anything. <laughs> but uh, you, you would have made a great date. <laughs> yes, yes. When the uh, Roxy Theater came into being, uh, uh, I started working there when I was 14 years of age as an usher after school and, uh, and on Saturdays uh, because at that time there was no Sunday movies. And I guess that's how I kind of got my baptism under fire. And eventually um, when other members of the staff, uh, particularly during the summer holidays, would, would go away on holidays, then I would fill in. So I got to know uh, just about everybody's job. But you also, Bob, chose a lot of the movies, as you talk about, that showed in the theaters, and uh, you actually learned to temper the audience and decide what was going to be a winner and well, so I, forth. I, I thought I could be a pretty good judge of it. Uh, uh, going back when the Capitol and Roxy was there, I used to go to Calgary once a month, and I used to book with a Mr. Paul Cardell, and a book a whole month's pictures for both the Capitol and, and the Roxy Theater. And um, there'd be a, a, just a, a mass of pictures to choose from at that time because they, they, they didn't come out with big epics like they did afterwards. These, uh, you signed a contract for so many A pictures, <coughs> so many B pictures, and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I used to go up there and, and spend a whole day with Mr. Paul Cardell and we would go through all the, all the distributors' pictures, and between the two of us, we would 
try to pick out what we thought were going to be winners. Sure, there were losers too. You became president of the association. Yes, yeah. yeah. The Alberta Motion Picture Theatre Association. I became president for two years. And um, then I became president of the National Association too. I kind of wore two hats at the time. It was a little difficult. Nobody wanted to run for the National. So I was at the convention in Toronto and uh, shows you how silly things can happen. Uh, we went down to the, to the pub in the, in the hotel and uh, I was the last one to get there. And I sat down in this chair and they said, well, there you are, you're present. They shook my hand. I said, what, what? We all decided that the last one to sit down in that particular chair would be the next president of the National <laughs> Association. So that's how, that's how I got it, believe it or not. You talk about people dictating what kind of movies are coming out. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to make the money to run the business, but how do you feel personally? You, you wear two hats. You might say that, Alicia, but sometimes you have to do that uh, because I cannot deny you or uh, uh, that age or that person um, from not seeing Let's say Jesus Christ Superstar, for instance. We thought twice about bringing that picture in. Caligula. Do you remember Caligula? It was purported to be a very, very nasty, nasty show with a lot of awful things in it. I refused to book that into Lethbridge. Yeah, I people. would not bring that in because I'd heard what a terrible picture it was. Now I. I say I had to wear two hats sometimes. There are times when we had to realize that with a picture like that, there was no way that I would subject anybody in, to let them see that picture. I was walking down the street one day and a professor stopped me and he said, who are you to censor my entertainment? I said, pardon me? He says, who are you to censor my entertainment? I said, what are you talking about? He said, Caligula, it's played everywhere else. I said, it's playing Fort McLeod. If you want to see it that bad, I said, be my guest. I'll even buy you a ticket. But I said, that is one picture I will never put on our screen. So you're criticized when you do and when you don't. That's right. I felt bad. When I say I felt bad, but I felt that I was right in that case. We had a lot of, of, of letters to the editor in the newspaper. Um, condemning us a lot of times for uh, movies that, that uh, were brought in. And I, my answer always was, and I never did answer the columns, because I, I think that type of a person is few and far between. And if you are going to rebut to them, I think you're just causing a problem again, and it's just going to go on and on. You open up a can of worms. Yes, so I, we never bothered. Lots of times I bit my tongue. I would have liked to have written back and said what I would like to say, but I always pointed at the box office and said, you have two choices. Why then did you go to pick to go to that one? 20 years ago, I started writing movie reviews, and I'd come out, and either Shaq, my dear Shaq, would be there, or Bob, and they'd say, well, and I'd go, ugh, or I'd go, you know, really good and that kind of thing. But there was never, I was given absolute freedom. There was never any pressure and no pressure, which could have been exacted and uh, has been in various areas where the, the um, uh, cinema owner has gone for the paper in which you were printed. I've, I used to feel bad, uh, particularly when that four letter word first appeared. I. Oh, I was I was devastated, devastated, and like you say, when that when I, I don't know which was the first movie that came out and used that four-letter word, I I would go and hide in the office. I couldn't face my customers. We, I'm sorry, we, that's the way I feel. We we tell them look at Playboy and Play Playgo, open that book up, huh? Are you, you saying that you look at Playboy? Hmm? Are you saying that you look at Playboy? No. Oh, I'm I glad you don't. <laughs> no, I, I got the answer to that. I can't afford to buy it. <laughs> Do you feel that you got out of the business just at the right time? Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. We've always said that, that you know, theaters will always survive no matter what. Uh, TV, um, 
the uh, video deal and everything. I mean, sure, we, t we, t we took a kicking, but we came back. I mean, it was just, just that easy because people still have to get out of the house and enjoy going to a movie and being with other people and hear the laughter and, and, and whatnot. What kind of a boss was A.W.? Excellent. I thought, oh, good and bad. Um, he'd fire you on the spur of the moment and hire you back on the next spur of the moment. Did that happen to you? Oh, three times, sure. Sure. He'd fire you in the projection booth and before you could get out the door, he'd, where are you going, mister? Get back here. I was at the ask you, Bob. <laughs> he says, is your dad boss? He <laughs> <You> said, <laughs> you said, and, and how? And how. <laughs> there was times when I wanted to throw in the towel. He was a tough teacher. He really was. Who? You. You once told me that you threw everything at me because you wanted to see if I had the uh, fortitude to uh, stay with it. Finally, mm -hmm. after 25 years, he decided I really wanted to stay in the business. That's when he started letting me have a little more uh, to do as far as the managerial ship was concerned. Now, here's the boss. Any regrets? Um, like I say, uh, the people. The, the, our customers, um, that's the part that I miss. It was very special. We miss you too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>